Let's start with a brief introduction of the nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the study of manipulating of matters in atomic or molecular scale. Generally, when we talk about nanotechnology, we, we deal with the structure, uh, feature size uh, like uh, one to hundred nanometers. By the virtue of nanotechnology, we can we can uh, we can still say that uh, the Moore's law holds true today, uh, which states that the number of transistors that can be placed in an integrated circuit doubles every year approximately. When you talk about nan nanometer, a nanometer is like uh, a billionth of a meter. A, a nanometer to a meter can be put in an another context like uh, a nanometer could be a size of a marble while, while a meter could be a size of an earth. So why nanotechnology? The answer is pretty simple. Because uh, with the use of nanotechnology, we can understand the, understand the structure of the matters, manipulate it, and then engineering, engineer it from the inside, which is a lot better than just studying it from the outside. The properties of the solid changes when we move from micrometer scale to nanometer scale. This, is, this, this could be due to the quantum size effect. The quantum size effect becomes dominant when the particular size are in the uh, few nanometer scale, like 1 to 100 nanometer scale. For example, let's consider gold. A gold in its bulk form is very inert material, but when it comes to nanometer range, it is very reactive. A common example of a material that is used in nanotechnology is carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube has many applications in nanotechnology, optics, electronics, and various other material sciences. Indeed, there is a lot of applications in which nanomaterials, due to their unique properties, plays the key role. Some of them uh, are completely novel applications, and some just based on the replacement of bulk materials on the nanoscale size components. For example, Intel Corporation developed 32 nanometer processors, which despite their size are not only more powerful compared to micro-sized predecessors, but also more energy efficient. Another example of nanotechnology could be found in medicine. Particularly, drug non-encapsulation is a state-of-art research, which is tremendously increasing the efficiency of such insoluble anti-cancer drug as, for instance, Paclitaxel. One of the uh, important discoveries of 20th century, carbon nanotubes, currently elaborated in various applications in electronics, in composite materials, and sensors. Thus, the group of Professor Michael Strand from MIT is studying sensor development based on the carbon nanotubes properties. Other promising applications of CNT are energy harvesting devices. This energy harvesting device we are talking about is made from carbon nanotubes and it was manufactured here in the Institute of Micromanufacture in Louisiana Tech University. Carbon nanotubes are nanomaterials so the use of nanotechnology can be well reflected in this energy harvesting device. Energy harvesting basically means the cultivation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor can be destroyed but it can change forms from one form to another. So in this energy harvesting device, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the optical energy, the thermal energy, and the mechanical energy and change it into electrical energy. Now electricity is the only thing we can use right off the market. This device has different layers. So what happens is there is a layer of carbon nanotubes on the very top of the device. The second part of the device has a PCT material, which is a piezoelectric material. And this piezoelectric material is actually sandwiched between two electrodes. Carbon nanotubes create an actuation. Carbon nanotube is a perfect black body, which means it traps all the heat energy that is incident from the light source. Piezoelectric material is uh, a material that if you use mechanical force, it generates electricity. And if you generate electricity, if you put electricity on the electrodes, it can achieve a deformation. On the device, the CNT thin flame acts as an absorbent of heat and light energy. This causes the cantilever to bend, creating a mechanical deformation from the PZT. So as the device vibrates up and down, electrical energy is generated, and this is the basic principle of the device. I will now take you to my lab where I'll show you how to actually make this device. So you are getting enlightened here. So, welcome to my lab. Um, 
So what we do is, in making the device, we need a carbon nanotube thin film, which we stick to the PZT wafer, and, uh, and then connect the wires to make the final device. Uh, so the things you would need are um, acetone, isopropyl alcohol, MCE filter, and carbon nanotubes. So you need 10 milligrams of carbon nanotubes, which you put in 100 ml of isopropyl alcohol, which I've already done that here uh, in this stuff. And we let it ultrasonicate in the ultrasonicator, uh, ultrasonicating machine for about 24 hours. So once we do this, we leave it here overnight. And that is when we come back tomorrow and do the further experiment. As you can see, the carbon nanotubes are well dispersed, dispersed in the IPA. Now we're going to use the vacuum filtration method to filter this using an MCE filter, uh, which looks like this. This MCE filter can be easily dissolved in acetone, and this, this is the main reason we use this. So what we do is we pour this IPA in the vacuum filtration chamber to get the carbon nanotube thin flips. The filtration took me five hours to complete. Once the filtration was done, I have carbon nanotube thin flames stuck on the wafer. Now, I have to take this carbon nanotube thin flame out and put it in the already diced PZT wafer. I'll show you the process. Once we peel this off with a double-sided tape, it kind of looks like this. And we measure the dimensions that are the dimensions of already diced PZT wafers, which I have here. So since this is a double-sided tape, I can use this to stick it right over the PZT wafer to make the device. So once the device is made, which I already have the device, I'm going to show you what it looks like. The PZT wafer that we diced was 25 mm by 8 mm, and that, that was the size of the CNT that we cut using a double-sided tape. The measurement was done basically on scale, and after we do that, the electrodes on top and the bottom are nickel electrodes that we connect to the device and the device is ready. We can connect this to a battery or we can use it in advanced wireless sensor network applications. Now we move on to the experimental results conducted with the device. So we have the device here. As you can see it has a carbon nanotube thin flame on top of a PZT cantilever. This cantilever is anchored to uh, support here. Below you can see a wire being connected to one of the electrodes and you have another wire connected to the top electrode. So these two wires are connected to the oscilloscope. So basically what is going to happen is whatever is the voltage generated by the device that is going to be displayed on the oscilloscope. This is our light and thermal source. Basically this is a lamp so the moment I turn on the lamp I expect the device to generate some voltage and I expect some voltage to be seen or displayed on the oscilloscope. So if you look at the oscilloscope right now, the voltage is zero. Well, that's as expected because you don't have any voltage being generated by the device. But the moment I turn on the source, I should see some voltage being generated by the device. So let's get this running. I turn on the source and as you can see I already start seeing some kind of voltage being generated. Now the scale here is a 5 volt uh, volts per division. If I reduce the volts per division maybe you can see it more better. So there you can see the voltage and it will keep fluctuating around the mean value now the frequency is not very uh, periodic so you can expect some uh, periodic fluctuation but the, the idea is basically it will go up and down about a mean value and when I turn this source off I expect another peak as you can see there is another peak there and after a while the device will come down to the steady state which would be zero in this case. So that's how this device generates voltage. I need your harvesting device have many applications in our daily life. Uh, right now 
uh, I will give you some examples. This is my cell phone. Uh, we can use the energy harvesting device to charge the battery. The device can also be used in bridge monitoring. Energy can be harvested by locating a generator and sensors on the bottom or top fringe of a gutter. Also use the vibration of the car to use it in energy harvesting. Various portable devices can be charged using energy harvesting device, such as radio communication equipment, cell phone, MP3 player, digital camera, mobile computer, and so on. There are many benefits of energy harvesting. First, this can reduce the dependency on battery power. Second, this can reduce the installation cost. Third, they can reduce the maintenance cost, uh, and also they can provide sensing and actuation capacities. They can provide long-term solutions. Uh, they can reduce the environmental impact associated with, associated with battery. We have seen nanotechnology as a good thing, but this is not always the case. Device fabrication need use of excessive chemicals which do not decompose easily and can cause degrading effects to the very environment we live in. Not only the environment, nanoparticles can cause serious risks to the manufacturing personnel and in some cases an individual who use nanotechnology products. Specific rules and regulation criteria for the manufacture and the waste disposal of nanotechnology should be created by the governmental authorities so that the negative effects of nanotechnology can be easily minimized.